Well, good afternoon. I'm Rich Dean. I know many of you in the audience from uh, having been president of the uh, NAA, the National Alumni Association, a few years ago. Traveled with a number of you and have seen many of you at other Northwestern events. And I'm very honored to uh, be able to introduce our distinguished panel of fellow Northwestern alumni. Uh, our panel stretches from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles in residences and around the world in experiences. And I, I know you don't want to hear uh, 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 have to have, to have me read the biographies that are in your uh, handouts, but I would like to highlight some of the other accomplishments of our distinguished panel. I'd like to start with, to my left, James D. Pasquale, a 1964 graduate of the Beenan School of Music. Mr. D. Pasquale has had an uh, active career in the music industry as a composer, arranger, performer, and record producer. He has played or recorded with a number of famous musicians such as Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald. He's also a three-time Emmy Award winner for his work in film and television scores, and he has been active in several professional uh, societies. He is currently a member of and was the organizing chairman of the Society of Composers and Lyricists, a 1,200-member organization, including John Williams on down to our most recent graduates from Northwestern. Nice to have you with us, Jim. Wayne Watson at the, well, let me, let me start here. I'll start with the, uh, move with, with Shah, uh, Samita. So we're moving right down to the left. Samita Shah is a 1994 McCormick School of Engineering graduate. She was destined for Northwestern because she did high school work at Cambridge. Uh, she is an engineering entrepreneur who started her own company, Spawn Tech, which is now one of Inc. Magazine's fastest growing private companies. After Northwestern, she received her degree at MIT and then continued with advanced degrees at Oxford University. Her professional accomplishments have been cited by, by many of the uh, valuable trade societies for young civil engineers. She also served uh, right after her Northwestern experiences as, uh, with the chief of staff in the White House administration. Next, we have Bonnie Daniels. Uh, Bonnie is a co-chair, has our, many of the individuals on stage of their current reunions or active committee members. Bonnie Swanson Daniels is a 1969 graduate of the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. She's a trustee of Northwestern University and a NAA or Northwestern Alumni Association Merit Award winner in 2003. She's a director of Management Systems International, which is an international management consulting firm in her travels, she includes 11 visits to Afghanistan, is very active in Africa, and also in developing Asian countries. Uh, she was part of a, a group of board of trustees that visited the Qatar campus of Northwestern in March to uh, observe that situation and also to be part of the dedication of, of that complex. Next, we have uh, Wendy Kronke Burdett, School of Communications, 1999. Ms. Burdett, is the co-founder of Plain for Change Movement, which is a nonprofit organization that uses multimedia to inspire, connect, and bring peace to the world through music. Among her latest accomplishments is establishing a music and dance school in Ghana. The Plain for Change or, or band has also produced a record, CD, which has appeared in, in a, a time slot at Starbucks is, and is now available across the country in, in leading uh, record outlets. She is a longtime advocate and participant in the arts, having worked as a choreographer, dancer, and actress. She, too, is very active in her committee work. I'll come back to uh, Pat Ryan in a moment, but first I'd like to talk about... Uh, <laughs> don't, don't be concerned, Let's Pat. <laughs> Shirley wrote your bio. Wayne Watson has three degrees from Northwestern. School of Education and Social Policy in 1969, the Graduate School of Education and Social Policy in 1970, and a PhD in that same school in 1972. Dr. Watson recently assumed the presidency of Chicago State University. He is Chancellor Emeritus of the City College, Colleges of Chicago, an urban community college system which is one of the largest in the nation. He has served as a valuable member in the past as an alumni trustee and extremely vital to the success of a number of committees including the Information Technology Committee. Uh, I would see Wayne uh, every afternoon in the, uh, when we were on campus together 
in the fall and spring, although we didn't talk a lot. Uh, we were on the 2 o'clock or the 2.30 buses from Patton Gym out to the Welch Ryan complex. He for wrestling practice and I for football practice. Wayne was more successful than I might have been. He was a top Big Ten wrestler and also an Olympic trial qualifier. He has served as the president of a number of other colleges in the Chicago area. Next to Wayne, we have George Dalama, a Medill School of Journalism graduate in 1979. Mr. Dalama is the external advisor for Inter-American Development Bank. I think many of you who are Chicago residents will recognize him from a distinguished 30-year career at the Chicago Tribune, where, we, where he was a, a managing editor for news, overseeing the paper's daily news reports and a news staff of nearly 500. Under his tenure, the Chicago Tribune won many prestigious awards, including the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting. And talking to George earlier today, it was an exciting time for him to be involved in such activities as the conflicts in Central America, the tear down of the Berlin Wall, and the, uh, the first Gulf War, where he actually, uh, I think, had a, a permanent seat on, on James Baker's plane. <coughs> He sits on the Medill Board of Advisors in the class of 1979 Reunion Committee. We'll return, to, uh, we'll return to Pat, and I think we all know Pat as the former chairman of the Board of Trustees at Northwestern, a longtime friend and supporter of the university. He was the fo founder and retired chief executive of Aon Corporation and a Chicago leader, of course known for his work with Millennium Park and Chicago's 2016 Olympic bid. He is uh, a well-known and leading benefactor of many civic projects, part owner of the Chicago Bears. And I've, I've often heard Pat say, and I think this, is, uh, this uh, describes Pat as well as anything could with regard to his roots. I have often heard him say, indeed in the last month, that everything good in his life he can tie to his experiences at Northwestern. And of course that begins with meeting Shirley Welch Ryan, part of a great partnership that Northwestern has enjoyed for many years. Having been, had an opportunity to serve under Pat on, on a number of activities here, I think it's an appropriate time for us all to thank Pat for his years of dedication to Northwestern. Thank you. Just as Shirley wrote it. <laughs> now it's my great pleasure to introduce Morton Shapiro, president of Northwestern University. Uh, Morty took office as, a, as the 16th president of Northwestern in September. He's a pre professor of economics in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and holds appointments in the Kellogg School of Management and the School of Education and Social Policy. How do you have time to run the university? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> president Shapiro is among the, the nation's leading authorities in the economies of uh, higher education with particular expertise in the areas of college financing and affordability and on trends in educational costs and student aid, which are prime topics, as we know from, from the nation's media. Previously, he spent nine years as president at Williams College. In prior years, he was a member of the Williams College faculty and chair of the Department of Economics and dean of the College of Arts and Sciences prior to that at the University of Southern California. Actually, in January 1, 1996, he was wearing different colors and seated on a different side of the field at the Rose Bowl. I, I think now we might get him to admit that Brian Musso's knee was down and that he did not fumble. <laughs> That's me, not Morty. Thank you, Rich. Everybody here okay? Thank God they didn't have uh, videotape back then, you know, and he replayed because he was definitely down. And we saw it in the locker room after when I saw the tape. The kid was down for about three seconds, but hey, wasn't our fault. <laughs> uh, anyway, and we're going to go back. I want to go back and take on those Trojans again from wearing the, the right color. That's what I like. <laughs> and I don't want to wait long either to tell you the truth. Um, thanks, Rich. So it's an honor for me. I, I've only been part of this community for uh, seven weeks. You know, many of you have been, you know, lifetime purple, of, uh, you know, so uh, involved with your family. We, we did an event before, and the most amazing thing, Rich, is when somebody said, you know, how many of you uh, were legacies, or how many of your kids came? And it was like the whole room stood up. It was just staggering. It was just the love for this wonderful university. 
And um, we have 240 or so thousand alumni. If any of you were at my induction about a week and a half ago, I had this line in there. I was talking about all the amazing things that make me so proud to be the 16th president of Northwestern University. And one of them was the 240,000 alumni. And as I said, going out there changing the world. So it's not easy to make this panel. Congratulations. Uh, you know, I, you are seven exemplars of what, it, what, what you end up with if you get it right in educating students at Northwestern. But I know you'd be the first to admit that there are many other ones who could be on this panel as well. And I think that's the great strength of this university that we love so much. Um, it's a great introduction for me as a newcomer to meet these people and to hear their stories. So what I'd like to do is we have uh, about an hour and 20 minutes is I'm going to ask a few questions. And then you see we have mics. And I'd like to open it up to the crowd. But the first one I, I just came to mind when you were talking, Rich, about Pat. You said Pat's always saying that his success is brilliant business success and, and creating Aon and growing into this amazing company, his incredible not-for-profit work, and on and on and on. He say he attributes to his years here at Northwestern. And when I look at the seven of you, you, you there are a lot of things that are different about you, uh, you know, and uh, race and gender and religion. And, you know, you graduated over the course of from 59 to 99, right? So, you know, the era you came, so everything was a lot different. But there's two things you have in common. One is you're at the top of your fields. And the other one is you all have Northwestern degrees. So I teach empirical economics. That's what I'm teaching right now. And what we do almost every session is we say, is it correlation or is it causation? So we know you're successful. We know you went to Northwestern. Is there really causality there? So the, the way I like to go down and, and start with you, George, and come down the line is maybe you can tell us a story about something that happened to you here at Northwestern. Maybe it's a professor. Maybe it's a course despite the professor. I hate to think about it, but I know it happens. Um, I have people all the time saying, oh, I, I love that course. Not you, but I love the course. So you, know, you live with it. Um, or maybe it's something that happened on the playing fields or an a cappella group or fraternity, sorority, whatever. You know, it's something that you can link back that ex helps explain your success reaching back to your time at Northwestern. So George, would you start? Um, sure. And, uh it is a privilege to be here with all these distinguished fellow alums. Um, I thought from my class you would take my colleague uh, Dave Boardman, who is the editor of the Seattle Times, who uh, Northwestern gave him uh, so much in his life, in, including Barb, his wife, who was there with him. They were both <laughs> classmates of mine. So you're not the only one. Um, you know, there are so many memories here. I'll just tell, I'll tell you one that I talk to students about sometimes. You never know when you're going to learn something that will come back and help you sometime in the future. And I had this experience as a freshman. Um, I come from a background, my parents are immigrants from Cuba, my father never finished high school. I grew up just down Sheridan Road in Uptown in Chicago, but that's like another world away. It was another planet when I came here. It's a real cultural shock. And uh, I was always interested in history and I remember freshman year, first quarter, right, just got to school, trying to sign up for history class, and all the ones that I thought looked interesting that I knew anything about um, were all filled up. So there was only one left, so I took it, and it was secessionist movements in West Africa. And I didn't even know there had been secessionist movements in West Africa. <laughs> um, as it turned out, it was a, and I can't remember the professor's name, he was a visiting professor from Ann Arbor who came for just one, uh, one quarter to teach this class. Uh, but it was a small group of people, about 15 people, and they gave us each a case study. And we got to pick one, and I picked uh, the, Kata the Katanga secession from Congo in 1960. Mm -hmm. So we, I buried myself in the stacks and where all the Afro-American history stuff was here, which I didn't know Northwestern had, which is a very cool thing. Um, we, had, we had discussions every week. We had a number of projects we had to complete in a timeline culminating in a big paper. Well, it turned out I just sunk my teeth into, sank my teeth into this, uh, this story. It was an amazing story. And I didn't realize it, but it was still being played out then. Um, fabulous class. I learned a lot about what had happened in Nigeria. Uh, learned a lot about what had happened in Congo learned a lot about the dynamics of colonialism mm -hmm. and that wave of independence that struck the developing world about 1960. 
uh, which had done so much to shape the world that I would enter after leaving Northwestern. Anyway, make a long story short, fabulous class, learned a lot, gave it everything, and so therefore I got that much back out of it. Fast forward years later, um, you mentioned I had uh, spent some time uh, as diplomatic correspondent for the Tribune. I did live on Jim Baker's airplane for a couple years when he was Secretary of State, and I remember one time uh, we're in, all, of all places, we're in Zaire to see Mr. Mobutu, Sese uh, Seco, and uh, Baker, in retrospect, was starting to deliver the message that it was time for him to go. This is a country that had $166 per capita income, and he had $5 billion in the bank somewhere in Switzerland and had a house in the French Riviera. Um, and, but I knew the story because he was a central figure, obviously, in that story, and I learned that at Northwestern. Fast forward just a little bit further down the road, after many years as a roaming correspondent, for some insane reason, I uh, agreed to come back to Chicago to become an editor. And uh, one of my jobs was to be the foreign and national editor for the Tribune for several years. Well, we have an outstanding correspondent then named Paul Salopek, who was based in Africa, and he wanted to go tell the story of Congo and how this jewel in the middle of Africa, just how it was it had been broken back from the time of Joseph Conrad. I actually knew something about that story from my time at Northwestern. Uh, Paul had to negotiate uh, with five different guerrilla groups to take uh, to get safe passage. He took a boat down the Congo River with a photographer to retrace uh, Joseph Conrad's fictional story in Heart of Darkness. But he had to negotiate with me for six months before I let him do it, that it were, before I was assured that I felt comfortable that it was safe enough. Anyway, he came down, uh, spent about six weeks on this story, spectacular story that told so much about what had been happening to a, a incredibly rich part of the world that was just broken and um, we won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting at the Chicago Tribune the first Pulitzer in 25 years wow. of foreign reporting for that story which I edited worked with Paul and my lifelong interest in that subject came from this freshman class at Northwestern that I took as I couldn't oh, that's great. Boy, the faculty should hear that, really. I mean, you can't make that one up. Yeah. No, that, that's just <laughs> spectacular. Wayne. Thank you very much. Um, now, I guess I'd have to look back on some of my professors and look at it from a contextualized point of view. And that is, <clears throat> individuals such as B.J. Chandler, he was dean of the School of Education, uh, Ray Mack, sociology, Lerone Bennett, history, and then a guy named Paul Bohannon in anthropology. Each one of them played a very key part in, in helping me to establish a foundation that allowed me to write a dissertation uh, at Northwestern when I got my PhD. That dissertation, uh, well, one, that process helped me to establish the, uh, the educational foundation in the value matrix that I currently survive off of every day that drives my mission, that allows me to function and allows me to deal with the different social justice issues that our country has faced and others that it still has to face. But coming out of it, the dissertation that I had to write as a result of being at Northwestern and being exposed to Paul Bohannon and B.J. Chandler. I got a call one night about a year after I had graduated, after I had gotten my Ph.D., and the person answered the phone, and the person said, are you Wayne Watson? I said, yes. He said, okay, my name is Alex Haley. Um, someone has sent me your dissertation. Pardon me? Oh. Let me just move the mic a little bit. Okay. Um, I got a call one night after I finished my doctoral degree and to about two, you know, late at night and the person said, uh, are you Wayne Watson? I said, yes. The person said, well, my name is Alex Haley. And um, someone sent me your doctoral degree and I'd like for you to fly out to New York within the next week to meet with me. Long story short, the next four to six years of my life, 
I've been as a senior research consultant to Alex Haley. Um, doing research that basically proved that the research that he did in his book, Roots, was not just a one-time phenomenon. They wanted to show that using oral history, utilizing grills and bellatees, and utilizing archival and genealogical, genealogical analysis, that you can actually trace one's roots from Africa to America. That was before they have the DNA, where right now you take a drop of blood and you know, they trace you right back. Uh, they, thank God I wouldn't have gotten my doctorate, Paul. <laughs> yeah. But um, it just tells you where you're from, that, that drop of blood. The drop of blood told me about a year ago that my people are from uh, Ethiopia and Greece. Okay? Go figure it. <laughs> uh, but I spent about four to six years working with Alex in terms of establishing uh, the research matrix and model that reassured uh, individuals or companies and foundations that the research that he did is possible to do. Fast forward another two years, I got another call about two o'clock in the morning, and it was literally two o'clock in the morning, and once again, it was Alex. And this time, you know, of course, we have become extremely close. And because uh, every, every weekend for about four to six years, I would fly to New York. He'd fly me up there. And this last call I got, and it's, I have to be honest, was the last time I had seen Alex. He asked me to fly down to Savannah, Georgia. I flew a plane. I was, I am a pilot or I was a pilot. I don't trust myself in a plane right now. I haven't flown in so long. But I was a pilot at that time. He asked me to, you know, he called it a rubber band plane. He asked me to wind up my plane and fly it on down to Savannah, Georgia. Because he was doing sh a shoot of a movie called Roots. And he said, Wayne, every time we get to a certain section in this movie, the cameramen cry, the director of the movie cries, and I cry. He said, I need you down here. And he also flew about two other senior research consultants down. And he said, we just, we have to get through this one scene in the movie. And we just need more support. So I flew down, spent about three days on the set shooting, uh, watching the movie Roots shot. And uh, got on my plane, flew back, flew back and um, Northwestern, without a doubt, laid the foundation. It was my doctoral dissertation that ended up in, on Alex's desk that allowed me to have that connectivity to what I view as one of the milestones of this nation's history, the book Roots and the movie Roots. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. defer to my distinguished colleagues to the right. I'm not going to follow these two guys. <laughs> You're a proud member of the great class of 59. It's your 50th, so you've had this unbelievable career. Yeah, 59. Well, you always generously say, as Rich pointed out, that you owe it all toward to uh, Northwestern. So tell us about it. Well, I'll be brief, and I'll, 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 I'll say that actually is very true. Um, Many of you will remember, all of the 59 class will remember the Little Red Schoolhouse, the School of Commerce, and we were an eclectic small group that uh, learned a lot. It was a great program. And I always regretted and talked to Don Jacobs as he was building Kellogg into the premier institution it is. I said, but Don, the Little Red Schoolhouse should not have gone away. You could do both. And I never won that argument with Don, but um, I do believe so much in, in the value of undergraduate business education because we had um, a great opportunity and 
then we had something called general business. And so I was in the general business program, which allowed you to major in a business um, subject, and mine was finance, but then minor um, in the arts and sciences, and, and so I chose literature. And so that integrated education, which is, was somewhat unique in those days, is now um, very important in, in, at Northwestern, in interdisciplinary education. And I say how important that was in, in, in my foundation, got me interested, obviously, in business. We would do case studies, and we, we had the same textbooks that Harvard had, and we were very proud of that. I mean, we're the, doing the same thing Harvard students are doing, but we analyzed businesses. And I, I learned uh, that I liked it a lot. I liked business, and I liked analyzing businesses. And that created an interest, obviously, in further than an interest that I had in getting into business, but the involvement just on campus, in addition to the classroom, was very formative for me. And now some of you will say, well, that's because you went to Marie's Huddle on Howard Street all the time and get involved in, in those kinds of uh, sociological studies, and that's part of it. But a, a very important part of it um, was, in fact, meeting people. and. I met a couple of people that were in the insurance business, and they'd come back to sell insurance to students. And that wasn't my goal, but my goal became um, getting into the insurance business because I wanted to be an entrepreneur in business. And as I looked at the insurance business through the prism of these two who had graduated just a couple years before me, the eyes, their eyes, I saw that there was an opportunity to get into business and without any capital, I didn't have any capital, start a business. And then it was further um, incented, that, that, that dream, when in my senior year, um, the president of the student council came to me and said, we've been offered to find a student who would want to set up a business selling scrapbooks on campus about the university life, and I thought of you. And I thought, well, that's nice, you thought of me. But I looked at this, and it was a great idea, but it was a rundown business on, uh, on Well Street in Chicago. The man had a great idea, which was to have the mo a montage of campus life on the cover, and then it was hardbound. It was a scrapbook for, mostly for young female students, you guys bought up and not many, but a lot of young girls bought the books. And so I created this, this business, and um, actually for a student made quite a bit of money, and I realized then that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I went into the insurance business with the intent of just learning a bit about it and then starting my own company, which I was able to do because in the insurance business, all you really need to start is, is sweat equity. You don't need capital. You just be willing to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, standing behind, as I said in the, in the Olympic initiative, I know how to do this because I used to stand behind things and jump out at people and say, would you like to buy insurance? In the Olympic thing, we'd stand behind potted plants in a hotel and say, hi, we're from Chicago. <laughs> so I had, I had this early upbringing to, um, to confront people <laughs> Uh, on, a, on an issue that, um, that I had as a mission. But the connections then developed because not only did I, I get um, into the insurance business, I got into the insurance business because of people that I met through Northwestern. And then when I wanted to go from being an agent to starting a business, the father of a friend of mine who was a fraternity brother said, if you ever need anything, you come to me. And he ran what was the Continental Casualties big branch office in Chicago. So I went to him four years later and I said, I need something. And you offered. And he said, tell me what you need. And he actually forced me on his company in a way that uh, nobody else wanted to do, but he wanted to help me. And he did help me a lot. And that led, obviously, 
to other connections, most of which emanated from a Northwestern relationship. And I had met my wife Shirley in 1959 in March, and I was two months from graduating, so I didn't want to start you know, a relationship. Then I had all these things I wanted to do, like I had to get my military done, and I had to get into business. But we re met in 1965. And the connection of Northwestern is what got us reconnected. And then, because I had some success in business, um, Northwestern rediscovered or discovered me. They didn't know who I was for quite a long time. <laughs> but they rediscovered me after a Tribune article. <laughs> And, you know, they're looking for money, obviously, but they said, would you like to go on the board? <laughs> so I went on the Northwestern board in 78, and that then triggered going on First National Bank of Chicago and others where it all came from Northwestern people. So this Northwestern network sort of kept propelling me forward. Um, and, of course, um, people say to me, well, you didn't get very far in life, Ryan, because we only went from Evanston to Winnetka. <laughs> but seriously, being in Chicago and creating a business and then everything just sort of reached out and expanded with Northwestern connections. And it still does. As I travel around the world, people say, well, I'm a Kellogg grad or I'm a Medill grad. And they, they basically um, connect because of Northwestern. And so when I say everything good that's happened to me in my life after I came here at age 18 has some Northwestern connection. So I'm eternally grateful to Northwestern for all that it has meant to us, our family, our friends. And so when you think about the broad and deep reach of Northwestern, I think I'm just one example of probably thousands, 240,000 living alum. So I would guess that in many ways they've all had that somewhat similar experience. So our gratitude has always been to Northwestern for what um, it provided us as a beginning and then as a progression through up until now, being here. A great privilege to be with all of you and to be here as our 50th reunion. The only problem, as Morty said earlier, it's shocking to become part of a half century club. <laughs> So Whitney, you have 40 years to be shocked. I do. Okay. So tell us about Northwestern and um, how it's helped mold you. Uh, yeah, Northwestern, I, I've been thinking back a lot on the last 10 years and the, well, the last 15 years, um, my education while I was here, and then the process of um, internalizing that education over the last 10 years and how it's guided me in the work that I do now. And I, w I was trying to think of a moment that really crystallized uh, what I see as as where I'm at in my life right now at Northwestern and it and it came to me I I spent my time here as a theater major and so I spent actually quite a bit of time on this stage which is really strange <laughs> um, but in the what used to be called the TI building which is right off the back of here I don't know if it's still called TI theater and Inter interpretation center and um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the way that the acting program is structured your sophomore year you enter in an acting class with the same people, you remain with them for the, the next three years. And you have class every single day for the next three years with the same teacher. And it is incredibly intense. And the relationships and the bonds of trust that you form within this, this class are, have surpassed sort of anything I've, I've ever experienced in my life. And I can remember it was during finals and our acting finals ran about 10 to 12 hours long. And we um, were rehearsing and I had an S scene partner and we went to sign up for rehearsal space in TI and the, <laughs> the only times that we could rehearse 
the night before our final were, I believe, 3 a.m. and, you know, 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. or something because so many students were so hungry to rehearse that there was absolutely zero rehearsal space except for um, those hours in the middle of the night. And that lesson has always stuck with me. Um, I always thought that a, a great deal of my experience at Northwestern, in addition to the fantastic faculty, was the fantastic company that I kept in the students that were here. And it, it was always so incredible to me, the dialogues that existed and how lucky we were to have that sort of um, constant inspiration and and fire and thought process and just things yet you were constantly thinking and and asking questions and and that's really and that that work ethic that that was exemplified in that passion in that building that night where I spent two hours in the middle of the night the night before a 12-hour final um, working on Medea um, because there was just so many other people in the in there doing the same thing um, has really stuck with me through the work that I do with playing for change it's it's been um, it's a it's a it's a project of passion um, and we've stuck with it and the perseverance that I learned and the bravery I think of of the of the people that I spent three years with in acting class has really allowed me to stick this project out and um, and uh, that I believe I believe I really think that what I got from the students of Northwestern, my fellow classmates, a lot of whom I'm seeing today, which is so exciting, um, has, has brought me to where I am. So that's, Thank that's you, my Bridget. contribution. Bonnie? Please. Well, my story is a little different. Um, it's not very academically oriented. I was an English major, and uh, certainly Northwestern uh, took me a huge step further intellectually and as an English major I learned how to read analytically and to write which I have found to be an extremely useful and saleable skill and actually one that's not very common in the world but the um, <laughs> I think you share that um, but the experience that I recall is when I was a senior, early in the year, there was a Peace Corps recruiter that came to the Alpha Phi house one evening. And I really didn't know what I was going to do after college, and I thought, well, I'm going to you know, just drop in and listen. And she talked about her experiences and uh, what, a, what it meant to go into the Peace Corps for two years, and I thought, aha, that is what interests me. This, I have finally found my passion. But, you know, then October came, and a very dear friend of mine, who's actually in the audience, Barbara Watson, uh, set me up on a blind date with my husband, who was sitting next to her. <laughs> we met in the grill, we fell in love, and I got married the next summer. We had to, um, that was the era of the Vietnam War, so, you know, I was not going to go off to the Peace Corps while he was in the military. We went off to Washington, and, and life kind of went on. Um, at that point in my career, I was doing national surveys for particularly hard to reach populations. And by that it meant people in rural areas, people in public housing projects, the elderly, and then refugees. So the State Department asked me to do an evaluation of the refugee resettlement program for them in the late 70s. And I finished that, and then I had had my three children. Somebody asked me if I would go to Malawi and evaluate an entrepreneurship development program. I went, all of this stuff just fit like a glove, and I was off and running, and I was at a point in my life where I actually could get into international development and do the traveling, um, et cetera, that it requires. And I often throughout my career have thought back to that Peace Corps recruiter. Um, I have been to many, many countries, worked at all different levels, from the grassroots to, to the most senior levels, and it truly is the, the mission of the Peace Corps and people like that that, that drove me. Um, now, kind of an aside and in a different direction, another, another thing that impacted me greatly was also non-academic in my junior year, um, with the Northwestern Ski Club, I went to Snowmass um, for spring break. And I was from Minneapolis and I had learned how to ski on Buck Hill and so seeing the, the Rockies in Colorado was 
it was just unbelievable for me and I thought this place is going to be part of me for the rest of my life and lo and behold I was lucky because Mike agreed and we took our children there forever and now we live there um, part time of the year, but I never would have seen no Snowmass had it not been for Northwestern. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Smita? Thanks. Make it a little closer to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, well, so I, my background's in civil engineering. I graduated from tech in 94. And I started my, you know, I, I chose to become an engineer because my strengths were um, math and science. And my, you know, I sort of asked my dad in high school, what, when, what does one do when you're good at math and science other than become a professor? I, I don't really know. But then my dad, a civil engineer, said, well, you become a civil engineer. <laughs> and, you know, so I thought, oh, okay, that's how that happens. And I just went forward, you know, I was innocent and I was young and I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna become a civil engineer. And I think that's where my certainty in my career ended. You know, I, I realized that was the most certain I ever was about my career. Then I came to Northwestern, and I think that what's interesting about Northwestern is that, um, you know, other than the classes are clear. You know, you know once you you know you get this curriculum, you get you know sort of your agenda. You need to take a certain number of courses. You have a certain you know at least in tech you have not only your engineering courses and your core courses, but you have this basic liberal arts background that you also need to obtain. And you know, you're trying to figure out exactly how does all of this come together? What am I gonna do with all of this? You know, and there's so much to offer. And I, you know, there's a professor at North, and in the engineering department, Professor Kreisek, and Dr. Raymond Kreisek, who's still here, I believe, and he uh, was the head of the Department of Civil Engineering. And there was a course that was offered called Engineering Law. And um, the prerequisite for that class was um, being a junior or consent of the instructor. So as a freshman, I had to go and convince the professor that I was both intelligent and mature enough to get the, the most out of that class, which as a freshman, I think we all remember being 18. I think there's more confidence involved than anything else. Yeah. And so you know, I went and I sat down and he let me take this class. But the interesting thing about that was it was an engineering law class. It was it was, as an engineer, you could be studying law. These were people who had gone to Northwestern who had studied engineering but had decided to go into another direction, and that's to study law. And you know, throughout my experience at Northwestern, that sort of level of certainty in your career, you know, he always had this broader approach to engineering. It wasn't that engineering, you know, there, he created this idea that you can be an engineer plus. You don't have to just, you know, in, there's much more attainable to engineers than just engineering. And you know he had project management courses. You could be a manager. He had brought people in who were um, part of interacting in policy, city engineers, people who were the head of um, agencies, and and these were all people who were engineering, but they were doing much more. They were you know influencing the lives of people on a day-to-day -day basis. They were running companies. They were just doing so much, and it it's sort of that in combination with you know sort of this was a liberal arts education, which at the time I felt was being forced upon me. <laughs> became, you know, in political science and everything. I took political science and economics. I did not take the Beatles class, um, <laughs> which a lot of my friends did, and that was always, I, so I got the experience, I think. Um, but it sort of became the pattern for my career that kept going forward, that, you know, I, I started out as an engineer, and I, I sat behind a desk for a little while. And then there's this idea that, you know, but you can do more as an engineer. So I, I thought, let's start a business, why not? And so I, I've been running my business for 11 years. I started it in 98. Um, and then, you know, this idea that beyond that, though, you can still be involved in policy and, and understand, you know, what are the decisions, you know, engineers make this tangible contribution of infrastructure and things that, you know, you're sitting in a building designed by engineers. But, you know, they're often not, um, often the, you know, it's often not that people making the decisions for engineering are engineers themselves, so why not? Mm -hmm. And so thus I went and worked in the White House right after, and I think people who knew me afterwards were shocked that I was gonna go and do it. Why would you do that, you're an engineer? Um, but all of that, it became the pattern for my career going forward to do you know, engineering, go into business, and you know, make sure I'm civically active and, and doing more than just engineering. 
Thank you, Smita. <clears throat> Last but not least, Jim. Well, <clears throat> how I got here is a textbook example of random access. Because I was destined to go to the University of Illinois. I was uh, a working professional in working downtown Chicago at the Sheridan Chicago and the very the Conrad Hilton and the Congress Hotel and various places when I was 16. So I was already a making money at, at 16, 16 and a half actually. And in the summer of uh, my 18th year, just a couple of months after I graduated, I was playing the Tri-State Fair opposite Ricky Nelson. Okay. And um, in a band from Chicago, the Dan Bellick Band, and um, the pianist was the assistant band director at Northwestern, Ralph Mutchler. And, um, Ralph was here on an advanced degree. I think at that point he was either a master's or a doctorate, but I, I can't recall, but I, it might have been even his doctorate. So he was an older guy, and he was a very good pianist, and he had started a jazz band here. We called it the Jazz Workshop Band in 1958, which was basically the beginning of the jazz program at Northwestern, which now exists uh, to the extent I think they have a master's degree in jazz performance. But at that point, it was an adjunctive uh, endeavor and there was no credit for it. It was uh, one night a week, uh, Monday nights, at, and the top floor of the band building, we rehearsed. And um, so he met me and he knew he was leaving Northwestern and he was looking for somebody to replace him, to run the band. And so over the course of three days, in Duluth, Minnesota, playing the Tri-State Fair. Um, one day of rehearsal and two days of show. And uh, in, in the interim, talking to Ricky Nelson and hearing about Ozzy and Harriet, um, we, um, we got to be pretty good friends. And he said, you know, you're a really good player. Um, where are you going to college? I said, I'm going to work for a year, make money. I'm from the west side of Chicago. And um, I'm going to go to the University of Illinois. He said, come and see me at Northwestern. So I did, and I went to see Ralph and John Painter, who was the director of bands, in the fall of 59. Meanwhile, I was studying privately here in, in Chicago, studying harmony and studying flute with a man who was the lead saxophone player at CBS. CBS then had an orchestra here on Fairbanks Court. and. Um, so they said to me, John Painter and Ralph, if you uh, want to come here, we will see that you get a full scholarship if you agree to run this band. So I was 19 at that, no, I was 18 at that point. I was 19 when I started. So no brainer. It, it sure sounded better than Urbana. And um, so that was my plan. So I arrived here in the fall of 1960 and I was basically a jazz musician at that point. I mean, I'd had a lot of band experience. I played, in, uh, I played at the DePaul University Band when I was a senior because my band director in high school was the band director at DePaul University. And he thought he was going to feed me into DePaul. So come and play with the DePaul Band. And I said, no, I'm going to the University of Illinois. And then he was not so happy. And then he was uh, even less happy when I went to Northwestern. But. Um, as, uh, as happened, I arrived here, and um, it was an explosion of new experiences. When I arrived at the first band rehearsal, now here's a bunch of 16, 17, uh, big band of 16 or 17 players, some of whom, most of whom, were graduate students. So who's this punk 19-year-old kid who's gonna tell us how to play? So um, it was a few weeks of pretty difficult going. Let's play it this way. Uh, what do you know? You're, you're a freshman. But um, the experience of getting past that, and we built the band to the extent that in 60, 62, they gave us a half credit ensemble. And that was the beginning, the real beginning of the jazz program. Now recently, one of the members of the band, who is now retired, living in Manhattan Beach, California, 
he, uh, he ended up becoming a com one of the first computer engineers at Xerox and retired at 59. And um, he called me and said, um, do you have any recordings of the band back then? And I said, I've got pristine recordings that I've stored religiously. And so we've been transferring this material. And um, we've transferred now uh, the 62 concert in Lutkin Hall, the 63 concert in Cannes, which were the first two big uh, jazz concerts on campus. Before that point, uh, the band had played uh, various and sundry little festivals around, but they never really had a campus concert sponsored by the university. And my experiences with the band were seminal because running that band and conquering that experience, when I got to New York and was you know, standing in front of New York, the top professionals in New York, um, it was, again, who's this little punk kid who's 27 years old going to tell us how to play? It's exactly what was going on in 1960, and the same thing when I got to L.A. And my first big job was at Universal Studios, and uh, there's guys sitting there. I bought their records when I was 13, mm -hmm. and now I'm conducting them. And it was all having to do with that. Some of the teachers here that uh, were really important tangentially to that jazz experience, Fred Hemke, who's still here, uh, Walford Kujala, who was my flute teacher, who's now retired, Ray Still taught oboe. He was a solo oboist of the Chicago Symphony for about 50 years. And he's, uh, I'm not sure he's still with us. I hope he is. But um, all of these people made big contributions. And Ewald Nolte was my counterpoint teacher. Um, Aaron Parsons was my advisor, the program annotator for the Chicago Symphony for something like 39 years. He's no longer with us. But all of these experiences have paid off in my professional life as I have moved from New York and then to LA. And um, even to the extent of leading this, this uh, group, which uh, was mentioned, the Society of Composers and Lyricists, which we started in 1983, um, as a, an exercise in trying to get a union for composers and lyricists, Hollywood composers and lyricists. There is no union for us, so we operate without any kind of benefits, without any kind of wage scales, and by dint of, of clout and long time uh, work, you, you may, one, 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 one tenth, one thousand per tenth percent of, of us who get to be a John Williams or a Henry Mancini, where you have some control of your income, we tried to start a union. The group now still exists as the Society of Composers and Lyricists. There's now a thousand of us. Uh, there were 400 when we were doing this. And I was the organizing chairman and uh, the first, first president. I mean, we, they called me the organizing chairman for a couple of years, but uh, in, in effect, I was the first president. But that, again, was, uh, I'm not a labor organizer, I have no idea, but show up on the first day, and it's the first day of the band rehearsal here in 1960. It's all the same thing. So that's what I owe Northwestern. Uh, the ability to stand in front of a group of musicians or a group of labor attorneys or the head of the, head of the NLRB and state my case and not feel uh, that I was uh, underwater. That's my story. Thank you. I'm not going to attempt to summarize it, except just pointing out one of the things that I think you all heard. It's pretty obvious that the range of experiences that affected you throughout a lifetime was pretty extraordinary. We started with a course. You know, and it's amazing how sometimes you take a course because when it's offered, where it's offered, your friends in it, whatever, and then you get a lifelong passion, as we heard. Uh, the value of some professors opening up doors to uh, the Alex Haley's of the world. You can never dream about those opportunities, but yet I think a lot of NU alumni tell similar stories. The value pad of the NU network that you benefited from and contribute so mightily to uh, since you graduated. The value of peers. Uh, educating each other and inspiring each other, as we heard. Um, the value of discovering a passion, and Bonnie, as you said, you might not immediately ex go into that passion, but it stayed with you for a lifetime, which was great. Uh, the value of an intellectual environment, and of course the value of great, as we just heard from Jim, great extracurricular or co-curricular opportunities. So this is an impressive range 
of reasons why you're here and why you're so successful. Uh, we have 35 minutes. I have questions, but I don't want to hog it. Uh, I'd love to hear from the audience. If you could just come up to the mics and identify yourself and ask the question directed to any of the seven luminaries here or, or to more than one. Brave souls want to go up to the mic? Please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Doug Jerger, class of 59. Uh, this uh, hit me about 20 years after graduating from here, and it comes back regularly over time. Uh, the question is going to be actually, was there one particular class, now in case of Mr. Lama, we, we are aware, and a couple of others are kind of close, but was there one class that you took that really kind of stood out, either, either motivated you to do things or that you subsequently looked back and said, you know, that thing really was pretty useful. And I, just for context, I, I was in the Red Schoolhouse with, with, uh, with Ryan and the, the Quants and Hutt for accounting, so undergraduate accounting and the MBA in finance. Uh, and when the software business on April Fool's Day of 1970, so I'm not so smart that day, but it worked out, it worked out pretty well. But over the time, you know, I did accounting with Arthur Anderson, and also the debits and the credits and all that stuff you got, and I took a course my junior year, which was called Human Problems in Business. We were out harvarding Harvard uh, in our case case, and I thought it was the dumbest class I ever took. And about 20 years later, I, sa I said, I told one of my associates, you know, I had this dumb class, you know what I've been doing for the last 15 years is really taking advantage of that class, and the things I picked up. So I wonder if you had any dumb classes that really did, did <laughs> were a benefit to you. That's it, it's a low, low, low level question. Good question, anybody, we, we obviously heard from George, others? I could just say I was dumb in some classes. <laughs> <laughs> I took a class, um, the professor, he had a joint appointment, Bob Hazard. He was in the school, of the law school, and also the, the school of education. And the course um, that I took, I think it was my master, either I was working on a master's or a doctorate degree, it was dealing with, um, at that time, they were called junior college education. And I said, okay, let me take this course and see what it's about. And that course, dealing with community or junior colleges, uh, eventually ended up being the next 30 plus years of my life, because I became the chancellor of one of the largest community college systems in the nation. And that course definitely had some impact on me. But what really jerked my heart was uh, about four years ago, I was asked by Dean, Dean Penelope Peterson, School of Education and Social Policy, to teach that course <laughs> at Northwestern University. And what was so you know, really got me was the fact that the last time the course had been taught at the university was by Bob Hazard. And I found my old celibate that Bob Hazard had handed out. That's great. Anybody else want to name a specific course? Bonnie, you're looking? Um, I think I had to take statistics as a requirement. And I didn't think it was useful at the time, but after I graduated, you know, I learned a lot and I was very grateful that I had taken that because it, it helped me do things like read the newspaper or listen to the news because I could analyze numbers and really kind of critically look at how perhaps they were putting out numbers or percentages because that is so much of what goes on today. You know, it's X percent of this, this population thinks that and the other thing. And absent that course, having been an English major, mm -hmm. I don't think that I would have had um, the knowledge to do that. Yes, me too. Um, you know, I'm gonna, uh, there's a course that I took in political science and it was taught by a graduate student. And it was interesting because one of the things that he focused on, it was an interesting course because it wasn't just about political science. We had a lot of discussion about values and responsibility and getting involved in the community. And I have a very clear memory of having a convert, you know, one of, the, one of the conversations we ended up having was just about, you know, the role of religion in society and whether or not people are getting as active in their community and why it shouldn't happen anyway, about people just doing more service-oriented activity. 
And it really stuck with me from the perspective of, you know, and I think the context of this was, you know, political science is ultimately, you know, people in politics are doing public service. And how, as a community, how, as a person and as an individual, can one get more involved in public service? How can you continue to do that? And I remember it because it struck me it was the only real conversation I had had about that throughout my career at Northwestern. It wasn't presented to me other than that. And, you know, it, it stuck with me, and it's something that I, I had, I've always had a strong belief, and I, I, you know, building on that conversation, you know, I, I continued to be involved, whether it was, you know, after I graduated, I think I joined the West Side Club in Chicago, and then um, continued to sort of increase my involvement to, you know, doing um, civic responsibilities, like I'm currently the Vice Chair of the Plan Commission. So, you know, this idea of constantly giving back and community service, um, that I, element of service learning, really presented itself in that course, and I thought that was a unique thing for me. Wonderful. Yes, please. My name is Jean Larson Danish. You were touched by your teachers. I was touched by you because I related to practically everything you talked about. When Wayne talked about the school of ed and social policy, it was part of my life, and DJ Chandler, and Bill Hazard work, and Patrick. Uh, one of the people who changed my life was W. Clinton Stone, and he still is because I have to admit I'm in cardiac rehab with a lot of musicians, but he <laughs> 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 I feel today. I feel happy, I feel healthy, I feel <laughs> I did know him very well. Yeah. So when we exercise, we listen to jazz music. <laughs> 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 so Ronnie, my granddaughter, who just graduated in June, is working at uh, Park City, Utah, as a senior snowboarding associate. So you all touched me. Thank you. Other questions or? Oh, here comes one. Great. Hi, my name is Lois Rowade. I'm both an Evanston resident and a Northwestern graduate, 1961, I think it was. It was. Um, <laughs> as an Evanston resident, I'd like to welcome you to our community. We are Thank very you. happy to see you here. Thank you. And my question to any of you, um, if you were to come back as a student now, would there be something that you would like to see different, added to, expanded on in the department that you were in? Great question. George, you want to go first? Well, um, I actually am on the board at Medill, the board of advisors. Not that my advice has been taken sometimes, but. Um, um, Medill, I mean, the industry that Medill prepared me so well for doesn't exist anymore. And so Medill, like all kinds of other schools of journalism, is trying to figure out what is the way forward. And, uh, and I applaud a lot of the efforts there. And I think uh, the folks at Medill, really, if they're being honest, would tell you nobody really knows at this point what kind of world of journalism um, uh, which is a field that I think is just so critical. It's indispensable to American democracy, to, um, to the society that we built. So that's a long conversation. But I will say, if I was coming back as a student now, um, I would hope that 
I would wish that Northwestern would be more diverse than it is now. It, it is much more diverse than it was when I was here, but it is uh, still not nearly as diverse as the world that students are going to enter, uh, particularly when you look at the emerging economies around the world, and it's not a unipolar world anymore. And uh, you have Brazil and Russia and India and China uh, who are all assuming places on the world stage. I hope Northwestern prepares students for that. And uh, the other thing that I found later that was very helpful for me, and then when I was a manager, as I went to the dark side and became an editor, I wish that some of my reporters had more than they did, was a deeper sense of history. And I think Northwestern actually, I talked about that one class, I wound up taking a lot of other history classes, yeah. but uh, I think it's really important. And uh, it, at a time when the world is moving so quickly and everything is happening like this, uh, and everybody's in a rush to wherever it is we're going, it's, it's really important to know where we've been. Wayne? I'm also in a blessed situation. I chair the School of Education and Social Policies uh, um, Advisory Committee. And so I'm blessed to have a dean that, that has worked very close with us. So I can't say I wish we could. But let me just, we, we can always do something else. And that is, I, I'm a great believer, as my friend said, you know, in the value of history, but also contextualized learning. Contextualized learning. And I believe that, I think it would strengthen Northwestern and it would strengthen the School of Education if we had more of it. And let me be a little bit more specific. Not only contextualized learning, but I believe that we as educators, not we as educators in terms of being university presidents, et cetera, but I'm not we as educators in general, we've missed the mark. Uh, there's a great problem in urban America and education uh, and, and unless we really figure out some of the causal factors that's leading to the miseducation that's taking place in urban America, we're going to have some very serious problems going forth in the next couple of decades. And we have not figured it out. We have not figured it out. So if I could change anything, I would like for us to connect not just our schools of education, but also our universities, more to basic research in terms of social justice, very similar to what the law school is doing here. Mm -hmm. The law school at, the school at, at Northwestern University is, is probably the best example of what I wish the entire university could do, and that is looking at the social justice issues, using its students in terms of a teaching research laboratory to solve some of the key problems of this nation. Great. <clears throat> Pat? Yeah, I would just say that um, I really do believe that things are, are uh, really in a great direction here. There are a lot of undergrads who are doing serious, important research we just met one the other night who's a scholarship student from West Virginia, and he's a sophomore, and he's doing serious research in one of the most important science labs in the world. And so what's happened at Northwestern, um, and I talked about interdisciplinary education earlier, but there's so much interdisciplinary opportunity that I would encourage students not to look for change, but to look for opportunity. There are so many opportunities um, that you know, it almost seems like four years is not enough to really take advantage of all those opportunities. But there is the opportunity for the, for the really dedicated student to get active as undergrads in serious research. So I mean, this is a great research institution with, with great teaching. And that's unique in the world, not exclusively obviously, but among the very elite unique uh, research universities. 
And I think it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for the young students to really get engaged in important research. Um, and, and it's happening, and, and uh, it's very thrilling to see. Thanks, Beth. Great, Whitney? Yeah. Um, if I could uh, come back to school, which I think about a lot, it would be lovely. Um, the one thing I would, I would do differently, you said there are, there are so many opportunities for undergraduates, and I, and I look back and I think, was, was it a missed opportunity or was, or was it something that I feel should be a requirement for students that it was the School of Speech and the School of Communications? Um, and my parents would be so happy to hear me say this now. Um, I should have taken more business courses and, um, or should have been required to take more business courses or, you know, really, really been aware of that opportunity. I think that that was the one, that's the one thing that, that I think, you know, we have this incredible, incredible university with so many different educational opportunities. And, um, at a certain point I got so focused on the conservatory aspect and the, and the training, the artistic training that, that it was easy to go, oh no, I don't need to take business classes. I'd much, much rather take circus arts. You know things like that, um, but that's the one thing where after after graduation I went, oh my gosh, how did I get into the real world without some? There is some some sense of what is going on, um, and economically and in the business world, you just I don't think you can exist without that sort of core knowledge. And so, if I were to come back, I definitely would heed those words of advice from my parents and take those business classes. So that's something to think about. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Advice to the students? Um, well, if I were to advice, did you say advice to the students? Well, it was advice? part of the question. Okay. It doesn't have right. to be. I mean, um, advice to yes. the area you studied here? Well, if I came back, or and I think if I did come back, because I know enough about the university, um, there's a much more, uh, there's a much larger emphasis on the international than there was at that time. Mm -hmm. And now there isn't the entire world. However, and, and Northwestern has come a long, long way, but I think that they still have a little bit further to go. And there are many ways to do that. I think it can be done in every single class. I don't think that there's a single subject that doesn't have some kind of global context in which you can look at it, whether it's um, an interdisciplinary course or just, or any other course. Um, I would be looking for opportunities to do study abroad programs, to do research overseas. Um, Northwestern, I think, with, their, with the opening of the campus in Doha, has done quite an extraordinary thing. Um, as Rich mentioned, and Rich also went along on this, I was so proud of Northwestern when I went to visit the Doha campus. It is the first time that Northwestern has actually offered a degree to people that went to school on another campus. And um, I was involved with the board and with some other things and with the thinking that went into that. And Henry Beenan was the president at that time. And what that school provides is a place in the Middle East where, where young people, about 75% of the students are women, but where young people can receive a very, very good degree. Uh, not only is Northwestern there, but also Texas A&M, uh, Cornell, Georgetown. Um, it's like a consortium of schools that all are bringing what really are their best programs to that part of the world. And I think that we need to do more of those things, you know, and, and those are not always decisions that are decided with uh, paper and ink and uh, cerebrally. They're often decided in the heart because it was Henry felt, for instance, that it was the right thing to do. And I am proud of that. Thank you, Bonnie. Smita? Well, I guess there's two parts to the question. So as to what, if I were to come back, I would, you know, I, I graduated in three years from Northwestern. And so I, I went very quickly through the process. And I probably would spend a little bit more time. You know, I discovered that I love college football, but I discovered it after I left Northwestern. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been to more Northwestern football games after graduating than while I was here. Um, and you know, I missed things. Like, I mean, when I was here, you could still throw the goalposts in the lake. Um, so I, I didn't get to participate in stuff like that. Now they can't. They finally embedded those into the ground properly. But you know, things like that. People, when you talk to people about Northwestern, they talk about football. They talk about dance marathon. They talk about the community of Northwestern as a whole, not just the educational. And I feel like I, you know, to students or to myself, I would say, you know, I would, I would love to participate more in that. 
Um, but to the engineering school, what would it, you know, the interesting thing about engineering, especially at Northwestern, is, you know, to some degree, it's, I, and, you know, I don't mean this sort of flippantly, but it's kind of easy to be just good at engineering education. Um, there are a lot of schools that are good, and you don't have to be, you know, MIT to be good. But you, you know, even IIT provides a tremendous. I love hiring people from IIT; it's a great engineering education. But when you're when you come to Northwestern as an engineer, you are, you know, the students here they're really the leaders of tomorrow. They're doing they're going to do much more than engineering. They're not just going to do engineering. They're going to, um, you know, they can sort they can be whatever they want. And I think that the important thing is, the interesting thing is students are also idealists. So you can also really give them this broad education. And I think the strength Northwestern has is that liberal arts background. But um, giving them that awareness of, you know, the practical, practical knowledge it will take them to succeed. Because once, the, and as well as um, sort of all of the things going on in the world and how they can impact it. The interesting thing is with engineering students or just students from Northwestern is they understand process, they understand how to think. And if you give them the awareness, they will figure it out and they will really be successful as leaders. That's great, so you Jim? Well, my, my answer is similar to Whitney's in the sense that the arts, people in the arts are drawn to that field because it's the intersection of emotion and talent. And um, we're, we're swayed in, if you, if you wish, by the, the desire to express and um, at, the, at the expense of virtually everything else in your life. And I think Whitney would probably agree with me, but uh, that <clears throat> explains the intensity. The music school here is very isolated, or was, at least when I was here, was very isolated from the rest of the university. And um, I, too, was, didn't discover football until after I left. But every Saturday, the band played my arrangements. But I think in the four years I was here, I never got to one football game. I attended all the band rehearsals, and they were playing my arrangements, and they did my rousers, and they did the something got to give with the trumpets all the way around the stadium and all of that. But um, I was busy working. I was working three or four nights a week. But um, I think the one thing that um, is missing, and I had lunch yesterday with the dean of the music school, Tony Marie Montgomery, and she mentioned this when we talked about what faces the musical artists of the future, or actually of you know, right now, as a matter of fact. The internet has made our lives a lot more difficult. But for uh, both us and the other artists I've met, uh, particularly in LA, but in New York as well, a lot of uh, actors, uh, some very well known, are good friends of mine, and I've heard about their careers. And in, a, in the sense of business, how the music business works or how the acting business works, we're all corks bobbing in the ocean. Once we get there, it's like try to stitch together a career. And I've talked to some great names um, in the past, some of you may know Alex North or David Raxson or Elmer Bernstein. And you talk to these people and you realize they've had long periods of not working. Elmer Bernstein didn't work before Ghostbusters didn't work for about three and a half years. And um, you, I think all of us are babes in the woods when it comes to business. And believe me, the studios and um, the production companies, they have crackerjack people, particularly the MBAs now that don't they're in the business of being in business. They're not even really connected to the films that are, that are being made. It's basically bottom line. It's basically, you know, your, your, um, your investors. And um, so for us, I think the music school, I think they're already in the process of doing this and other schools around the country are already doing it. USC has a music business course. Berkeley College of Music in Boston has one. Even Columbia College here down South Michigan Avenue has one. And I think Northwestern is, is, is about to have some kind of a course in, in music business. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important because what's happening in the internet, you've seen Tower Records disappear, Virgin Records disappear, uh, Borders is on, the, is on the list. And the studios are now starting to feel the heat of downloads with, with um, um, their films. And uh, all of this stuff is, is, is affecting our 
possibilities for employment. And it's all happening right now. In Congress right now, um, I met with the Register of Copyrights about a year and a half ago about what constitutes a download. And we have to know this stuff. And for somebody who's practicing scales in the beehive, you know, um, it, it, you think, why do I need to know that stuff? But you do, because it affects your career. And I think if we had a good music business course or a series of them based on what's going on in contemporary media right now, um, it would make a big difference. Also, there's one other thing, too. When I was here, there was nothing in film scoring. In fact, um, my composition teacher wouldn't even look at anything that I wrote for the Jazz Workshop Band. He said, if you choose to spend your Monday, Monday nights rehearsing, it's very nice, but this is a serious composition course. So it wasn't looked upon as being serious. That's all changed. But I think that what's now needed, what needs to be added to this jazz program that we have here on, on campus is something having to do with the business side of, of things so that when we arrive in a New York or in LA or wherever, you are not a cork bobbing in the ocean, that you have some control over your destiny. And I think this is also true for actors that, you know, and I'm not sure what the acting schools are doing or what drama is doing here, but I think it's really important because uh, in the position that I have been in, in trying to start a union and also being on the board of directors of the SCL now and considered one of the, the mockers, if you will, of, uh, of uh, this whole uh, area in LA. And so they, they have opened up uh, um, windows to what's coming in terms of media. And it's very, very threatening to our continued profession because we, we get, when you see a score on television, see an HBO movie and there's music, there's a performance royalty paid to that composer. And that's in danger of being dispensed with. And that keeps, and as I've discovered from talking to these older artists, uh, uh, Miklas Roja and all these great composers of the past, that's what kept them going all these years when they didn't work for three years or didn't work for two years. And that's in, in great danger right now. And so to protect ourselves, I think the music business course would really help. And if I came back, that's what I would really like to be studying. And also, I would be happy to have better food. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that great note, uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, just, I learned a lot as the new president. I felt like I got some good advice, the food, the business program, and on and on and on. And on behalf of the whole audience, please join me and thank our panelists.